All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the seven myths of audiobooks. And I have brought the two most perfect people to discuss this uh, today, uh, Mr. David H. Lawrence, the 17th, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Florida, uh, like a month and a half of two months ago, my God, time flies. Um, and you may recognize him from your TV screens <laughs> as an actor, but he's also a master voice artist and, uh, and a course creator, as well as Mr. Dan O'Day, who uh, works in comedy writing and uh, I, that's all I'm going to say about them because I want to get right into it. <laughs> um, I had started to formulate questions and then I realized from the title that you guys proposed that almost all my questions were probably going to be related to the myths. So okay. um, um, I'm going to get into the, what I think are some of the myths and we can we can talk through them. And then at the end, everybody's going to everybody who's live. Uh, thank you for joining us live because you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, I'm Daniela Sione. I think you guys know that. So um, all right. So uh, I think there's a lot of people who do intend to create audiobooks in this audience, whether they are actors or not, because we have a lot of writers in the audience. Um, is it true that you need to have a great voice? No. <laughs> it really, I mean, the, the answer is, it's nice if you have a what's considered to be whatever you consider to be a great voice, right? It's nice. It's a, it's a, it's an additional bonus. And the real, uh, the real requirement is to have a voice that's expressive and tells a great story. You know, the, the people that we pay the closest attention to don't necessarily have the best voices uh, or, or what, society sometimes labels as deep, resonant, really bassy, you know, that is that what you mean by a great voice? Who knows? I mean, right, some yes, people, yes. some people look at Rob Paulson or, um, you know, E.G. Daly as having a great voice because they can do a lot of different voices. And I think the, the truth of the matter is, is that if you have a passion for storytelling, if you love to be that person at the party that's telling this great story about that time that you met that guy that did the, you know, then the thing that happened, you know, if you're just really uh, enthusiastic about that, then it's extraordinarily likely that your voice is just fine. Yeah. And what one test that you can give yourself is if you have ever successfully told a story to a child, successfully means they didn't run out of the room screaming. <laughs> um, and you held their attention okay you're the, the kid didn't say you know your voice uh i'm not so sure that's can you carry the story and there are what one person thinks is a good voice somebody else doesn't and if you could tell a story that's all you got to do you know what's interesting every time i go to buy an audiobook i'll listen to the sample and Sometimes I'm like, why is the author narrating their own? And, and they're not necessarily the greatest voice, but it's a best-selling audio book. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, that happens all the time. In fact, there are some authors that I would much rather put sharp sticks in my eyes than, <laughs> than listen. And, and I'm, talking, I'm talking to you, Stephen King. And I'm talking <laughs> to Stephen King because Stephen King has a speech impediment. He has a liquid L. David, um, but you might be damaging the sales of his books now. I <laughs> might be, and I might be subject to legal action for that. But no, I mean, it's like uh, we, we had a, an anchor here in the United States for the longest time on NBC, Tom Brokaw. And hearing Tom Brokaw say the word militarily was like, oh, we got to switch to Channel 8. You know, it's like it, it, was, it was hard. But yet people are willing to overlook that. And that applies to people who decide to do this for a living. People overlook that when the storytelling is fantastic. You know, Stephen King is really good at telling his own stories. He has backed away from doing that. Uh, he has really, really great narrators doing his stories now. But I would think for the most part, writers tend to be very, very expressive about what they do. And that's why I think that in general, authors should at least consider whether or not to do it if they don't want to do it because they don't want to be out there they don't they're, they're not very 
uh, public about themselves or they're introverts or they just don't, they, they look at the whole thing as this huge mountain of work that they don't want to engage in. Okay, we can, you know, we can provide you with graduates that do this and are great at it. But we also have a subset of our, of our students that are authors of their own books. And also I've noticed something else. They'll take our class as a voice talent and then they'll go, maybe I'll write my own book. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll write a book. Maybe I'll write a book and then I'll voice my own book. That'd be good. No, I, you know? David, I thought you were going to say the, the opposite, which was we do get a number of people in the class who are authors and they just want to learn how to do their own books. Yeah. And then before we know it, they're doing that too. audio books for other people. That too. In fact, I, I remember I read it. I listened to a book uh, called uh, Essentialism. And the author of that book is a British guy who, if he wasn't an author, a great author of productivity books, he could make a living doing audiobooks because he's got that <laughs> beautiful, rich, received pronunciation, British accent that we Americans and probably you Canadians just fetishize. And so, yeah, I mean, there's all different uh, opportunities, but the big takeaway is don't be too hard on yourself if you don't think your voice is good enough because you're likely very wrong. And and we've all got our like we've all got our audience. I I was always so self conscious about my lisp, and I've had so many people write to me and say I fall asleep to your YouTube videos because your voice suits me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, absolutely. I'll, I'll take it. Um, so there's going to be a lot of absolute beginners. Do they even stand a chance in the, in the marketplace? Sure. Sure. I mean, the ACX is one of those, ACX is the audiobook creation exchange. That's what we teach people how to uh, excel at, to build a business on. ACX doesn't have any requirements or licensing or, or credentialing or, you know, auditioning, prove to us you can do this. It's a very democratized access. Uh, thing. So now the, the good news there is that anybody who can be wants to be on ACX can be on ACX. The bad news there is that anybody who wants to be on ACX can be on ACX. <laughs> and there are some people who should not go anywhere near a microphone. Some people, nobody listening, watching this, of course. Um, but the notion that um, uh, very beginners are somehow handicapped you know, one of the things that, you know, Dan teaches parts of the course and I teach parts of the course. And one of the things that Dan teaches is how to write your profile on ACX in a way that is really inviting and scannable and lovely rather than a mountain to climb for a rights holder, an author who's looking for a voice. <clears throat> and we get the question all the time, well, what do I put in the credits section? I don't have any credits. And we have some phrases that we share that can really entice a rights holder to go, huh, let me listen to their samples and let's see what the story is. Beginners um, have an advantage over people who've been doing this a long time, not on ACX. You know, I've been doing audiobooks since the early 90s. Oh my God. And yeah, well, you know, Books on Tape was around long before Audible was and, and, you were reading from tablets as I, I was back. Then. Yes, I was actually <laughs> waiting. I was waiting for the chisel marks to, yeah. to kind of even out before I actually grab them. Um, and so many narrators, when ACX first came out, established narrators were really like kind of arrogant about ACX. Like that's the bottom feeders. You know, you need to go to a real studio, not work from home. And you know, I, beginners don't have that sort of, you know, sense memory that prevents them from going, oh, okay, let's do this. I mean, you know, we're in a, we're in a time where content creation, <laughs> you know, think back to when we were kids and we were watching cartoons on Saturday morning or movies, you know, at the theater and what kind of uh, facilities needed to be in place to make that stuff, right? Today, you know, if you've got a cell phone, you've got a whole studio in your hand <laughs> and the standards are higher. 
you know, you got to have the standards of, of quiet spaces to record in, which we talk about in the course as well. But what beginners don't have is that whole, this is how it's done thing. Mm. And I, you know, some people call me a coach. I consider myself to be a consultant. I think the difference is a coach keeps asking you questions that you come up with the answers with to get to the answer that they could just give you. And in my case, I want people to get started right away. So I tell them what kind of equipment to get. I tell them how to set things up. I'm a consultant, not a coach, but I'll take the title. It's okay. But beginners have an advantage, I think. Well, also um, for a beginner to begin a uh, break into audiobooks to start an audiobook career is about a thousand times easier than a beginner starting a voiceover career huh and, and david you, as always please correct me because david is no, very accomplished absolutely true. yeah huh. i mean if you're going to start a vo career i'm not saying don't do it but you better be prepared to really be building it's a lot of work because there are a whole lot of people out there and it, it, it but but with audiobooks it, it's it it's easy to get up to speed real real quickly and mm -hmm. if you do a decent job with your profiles and with your demos and with your titles your books then you'll attract work whereas uh, starting a new vo career could be a little more challenging yeah and i also think that the the the, the super secret superpower skill that we teach in this course is customer relations. Hmm. I know it's like somebody's going to go, what the hell? Who cares? Trust me. Oh. <laughs> I am a member of probably 650,000 Facebook groups uh, with professional. Literally that, literally that many? Literally that huh. many, Dan. Literally. Not figuratively, but no, literally. literally. Wow. Yeah. Literally, um, and and the number of opinions about what you should do in a particular situation when a rights holder uh, has this that they're asking or this that they're demanding or this that they're suggesting uh, are as wide and vast as, you know, the Great Plains out in BC, right? So um, I, I, just, I just feel like if you have a guide to help you uh, come up with things that kind of make sense from a customer service standpoint. We even give you a set of pre-written responses to pretty much every question I've ever been asked, because I'm one of these people that um, like gathers my answers and keeps them to use later. Like I'm a use once, you know, or create once use many kind of guy. And so we have this whole setup of, of responses, like one of the most common questions that people that new authors or new rights holders will ask is, hey, can we add some music to this? This would be great. Maybe some sound effects. That'd be awesome. And the answer is no. Absolutely not. Now, how you say that is, well, there's copyright issues, there's production issues, there's listener uh, revulsion issues. People, you know, listeners don't like that. Um, in very rare cases, you'll you'll have a, a book uh, version, an audiobook version of a movie, and they'll hire the entire cast of the movie to voice the book, right? Uh, and there, it becomes more of a radio play, and there's a right. subcategory of books that are like that, but the vast preponderance of books are not. And so you just share that with the rights holder or the author in a way that makes sense, and you become this, like... Uh, you know, guide for them in this business. And that is so profound. They feel taken care of. And that is gold when you're providing a service like that. Yeah, that, that may be, that's one um, adjustment that some people might want to make. A lot of people assume that uh, a, uh, an author or a rights holder, they're looking for the best voice out there. They're looking for someone that they feel confident in turning over their project to who's going to be a project manager. They're going to handle the whole thing. Everything is going to be, you know, it's like when you, if you hire a, a handyman to fix something or an electrician or a plumber or whatever, I don't know any of those things. So I just have to hope that I've hired well. And that's 
that's the way to get all clients fast is for them to feel I can trust this person to manage the, the entire project. And that's why what, what David refers to as customer service, I think of as client management. Yeah. Um, sure I, I, want, I want to clear that the narrator is in charge of the show. Great. Yeah, because you're narrating slash producing really, right? Correct. When, you, when you accept it. Absolutely. Um, I failed to mention at the beginning how many students you have that have created, I mean, how many books your, your students have narrated? Gosh, Dan. I think it's about millions. No, but <laughs> over the course of the time that we've been teaching the course, which is since 2014, our graduates are responsible for nearly 5,000 books yeah. in the marketplace, just over 4,800. Yeah. And so great. that's what we know about, right? Because we've got a lot of students who like, thank you very much. And they're off to the races. They don't necessarily stay in touch. I have no idea how many books they've that's, done. That's a very good point. Because these are the ones who tell yeah, us. Yeah, these hey, are the ones who actually... Time brag about it and go, okay, yeah. And we have our, our, our team actually goes and looks for titles that have been produced by, and then some people, we have a lot of clients who do work in erotica mm -hmm. and do work in uh, children's books uh, or faith-based books. And they may assume a narrator uh, name that's different from their normal narrator name. Because if you're doing just as an example, if you're doing erotica or faith-based, but you're also doing other books that don't necessarily fall in line with that category, you might want to choose a different name. We don't know <laughs> what, how many books you know, people have done in those spaces where they're using stage names. So we're really proud of the fact that not only does this work, but the proof is in the pudding. And I, I just, and right now on ACX, if you were to go over to acx.com, and just pull down the search menu and not fill in anything on narrators for hire, you'll find that it's the mid six figures. It's like 500,000, 600,000, something like that. And that creates, because anybody can play, even if they have no idea what they're doing, that creates this noise floor that we try to help our students get past oh. so that they stick out like a sore thumb if your profile isn't stupidly written with irrelevant demos that have nothing to do with audiobooks, and you're talking about how you played Annie in the sixth grade, and you know, it's like there are people who just don't get it. And then there are people who've been given a, just a smidge of training. And our, and our course is not a smidge, it's, it's a deep, deep dive. Imagine the advantage that you have of knowing what's going to attract your customers and knowing and being confident about being able to say, I can help you. I can take care of this for you. I can voice this for you. I can produce it to Audible's technical standards. And I can show you how to do all these other things, promotion, uh, the, 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 um, you know, the, the idea of how the book is marketed. Uh, we help them market their books. We have a built-in oh, uh, process of, of creating videos from their, their, you'd mentioned you listen to the, the retail sample whenever you listen to an audiobook before you grab it. So we have a process for taking that retail sample and making it a social media happening. Oh. So all kinds of good stuff. Oh, well, you answered my next question, which was going to be, how do you break through all the noise? So that's wonderful. Um, and and the, the, first, the first way is, as David said, the profile. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that your profile has to be clever or witty or any of that stuff. Anybody watching right now, if you, when we're done, if you go to ACX and just pick narrator profiles at random and read the about the narrator page and you get dizzy. <laughs> it's like, you know, well, you know, uh, but before I, before doing this, uh, I, I was, uh, I worked as a chemist for nine years and, and it, they just go on, they, they put their resumes up there. And so the test is you, if you want to pretend that you're a rights holder, an author looking for someone to produce your baby and you're looking at that profile, would that pull you toward them or is it just them talking about themselves? And I would estimate 98% of the people on ACX, they simply put up their, their professional resume 
and as if anybody cares. <laughs> So because producing is a thing and that might freak some people out because we have a lot of performers here. Um, yep. What, I mean, I don't know if they're here now, but in, in, my, in this Mondo cinema audience, the technical requirements, how mm. achievable are they? 100% achievable. The good news, the bad news is there are technical requirements to worry about if you want to call that bad news. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to call it bad news because there's a reason for it. The reason for it is so that your expectations are met when you purchase an audiobook, it's not too soft, it's not too loud, it's not too harsh, it's not too bassy, it's not like everything about it is designed to create what every other manufacturer of a product is, and that's product consistency. Mm -hmm. So when you go to listen to an audiobook, you don't have to readjust your headphones, you don't have to do it. And you can also hear an audiobook over environmental sounds like a car rumbling or an air, you know, an airplane, you know, because where people consume the material is why the technical requirements exist. The also the even better news is that once you are given the settings to put things at, you can set them, forget them, and just go about your life producing the books. You don't have to like sit there and go, gosh, this is a horror book. I wonder if I need to do something different. No, <laughs> you don't. Go to my horror settings. You're, yeah. <laughs> and I and I just I just finished doing a podcast episode about this like maybe three days ago about people who are inveterate tinkerers, right? <laughs> they just can't leave well enough alone. They achieve something and they go, oh, is that good enough? Mm, I don't know. I mean, I mean uh, you know what? I'll get that new box and I'll sound better and I'll book more. Mm. <laughs> and so the, the couple levels, first of all, can you even get to where you need to go to be, uh, you know, in tune with their tech requirements at ACX and at Audible? And remember, these are Audible's tech requirements, not just ACX's. And the answer is absolutely. If you have a relatively quiet space and that attendee that you'd mentioned earlier uh, who builds booths can can tell you this. If you have a relatively quiet space and you just can't quite get to the minus 60 dB noise floor that you need for the space that you're in, you probably can use very carefully, you can use noise reduction to get there. But for the most part, if your mic is set up properly and you're attacking it properly, and you have your space set up so that it's not reverberant. It's not like sounding like you're in a bathroom. A lot of people think that's a good place to do their <laughs> audio books. Okay. Um, you know, you're there. And we show you what software to use. I have a super secret editing process that speeds up the whole production process without in any way impinging on the quality of your work. And the more books you can get done efficiently and with high quality, the more books you can take and add to your, you know, your portfolio of work that in the case of audiobooks is kicking off royalties if you're doing royalty share or royalty share plus and giving you really good income on a one-time basis if you're doing per finished hour. There's a number of different ways of getting, getting paid. Um, but once you get that dialed in, once you go, okay, this is where my input level is set, leave it alone. This is how far away I'm supposed to be from the mic. This is how to play it when I'm ye yelling. This is how to play it when I'm whispering. Once you have those things down and they become second nature and we show you how to do all that, you don't have to worry about it ever again. Great. And and Danielle, um, a, a couple of things. One, D David mentioned that the uh, specs, the audio specs for ACX are very specific which they are. That's not to say they're difficult. They're specific, but they're not difficult. If you, you know, you know what you're doing. So you don't have to be an audio genius for that. And then, you know, we, this is a four week class that we teach once a year. And it's in week three that David teaches his stair step method of editing, recording and editing. And no matter how much we assure people, no matter how many times they've watched the videos and no matter how many times they've asked friends who took the class, is it really doable? 
there's a palpable fear among some people. And week three, after uh, you know David uh, releases the video in which he takes you just step by step how to do it, people are ecstatic. They're over the moon. The next one, and really, and, and and what I liken it to, you know, you, sometime in your life you probably have been wowed by a magic trick, and you convinced the person to show you how it's done. And it was kind of, has that happened to you? Um, I'm sure when I was little, Maybe. yeah, for sure. Well, um, no. Now she knows how all magic tricks are done. <laughs> yeah. She's a script supervisor, so oh, she yeah. knows. There you go. I'm, I'm nonplussed by anything. Yeah. Uh, um, the, anyone who's experienced that, and David, I don't know if this applies to you or not. Sure. But almost invariably, when you're shown how the trick is done, your reaction is, well, that's it. And you're kind of dis you're disappointed. It's like, oh, I wish I hadn't asked because this is nothing. It's all I, uh. well, when people see the video on David's recording and editing method, they actually will say in the mastermind group, that's it. But there's no disappointment. It's like exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. That's it. Real. That's it. And they <laughs> Do it. It's it's amazing. It's, uh, and and know that you know the system that I came up with, which is called the stair step method. I've been doing punch and roll, which is like the the standard classic way of doing audio books, at least straight recording and punch and roll recording for a long time, based on a piece of software that almost everybody was using and some continue to use called Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. And so that's just the way it was done for years and years and years. Pro Tools is expensive. It's a monthly subscription if you're getting the Creative Cloud, or it's a $700 purchase if you're buying it outright. The installation process is months long to some people. Uh, the learning curve is incredible. So we choose a free piece of software to record with that everybody uses. It's called Audacity. I use that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we take advantage of a behavior that Audacity has that I noticed, and I'm like, huh, wait a minute, just a second. And I spent a good, you know, long time perfecting this thing so that my work happened faster with fewer errors and with incredibly high quality. And that's what we teach in the course and people just adore it. I could go back to using Pro, uh, Pro Tools and, and Punch and Roll if I wanted to, I don't want to. And I do a lot of audiobook work. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's so, so great. And this is a related question. And I guess it ties into like what I would think would be one of the myths is I have to spend a lot of money on gear. Uh, yeah. Um, well, now you're, you're in Canada, right? Yeah. So, you know, the, you'll have to adjust it. Maybe in, Can in Canada, this is a lot of money. It's about what around $200 US. <laughs> which, so like 300 bucks Canadian. Which and last I heard was like, Three thousand. See the microphone. Canadian. See the microphone that Dan's using. Yep. That's the microphone that I recommend, and that I use for every audiobook you see on Audible that wasn't recorded in some big publishers' studios like Penguin Random House or Audible's studios, and people just their minds are blown. There are these very unicorn microphones, this is one of them, that just work and work well and are easy and don't require fiddling with dials and, and it's just awesome. And it's also far less expensive than you would think. So, yeah. Uh, so David, um, a lot of people watching this, they, they've got a Blue Yeti um that's what i'm the using other thing that i can never remember the name of what do you think uh, is that good enough no no no, no. so it's not yeah this is inexpensive it's not oh go get any mic this is a great mic that's like a, all by itself you know it, it, they said apparently the company said you know let's make something really good that's not expensive and we'll do it this way and it's terrific but it's not um because of 
don't go out and buy all the, when, a lot of podcasters will use uh, they use blue yetis and they'll talk about it in the podcast saying you know we got this uh, great blue yeti and the snob in me is going <laughs> give me a break and there's nothing wrong with it for a podcast probably but yeah and people will look at that and go uh is that a studio microphone because i've heard you should never use usb microphones and the answer is no, it's a USB microphone. It's the exception to the rule. Uh, there are a couple of USB microphones that use the same high quality electronics that a studio microphone's interface would use. It's just in the bottom of the mic, and this is one of them. And we show you how you attack it best, how you address it, where to position it, uh, how to use it, uh, what it's really good for and good at, and that's been one of the joys of this class is helping people overcome that hump of, well, I thought I had to spend like, you know, $2,000 on a microphone and mm -hmm. 500 bucks on an interface. And okay, here's the result. This is the microphone <laughs> I use. It's 150 bucks on a bad day here in the U S on Amazon. So yeah, we, we try to aim for that sweet spot of not spending a lot of money on something and not underspending either on a microphone that isn't good enough. So. Okay. Um, oh, okay. And someone did ask me this. How many, how much range do you need to have as a voice actor, like dialects or anything like that? I thought you were going to say like from, you know, low G to high <laughs> E flat. I don't know what that is, means. <laughs> yeah. I, I believe for about from Ontario to Saskatchewan, I believe would be the range. <laughs> So I'm, um, I'm of the opinion, and this is one of those areas that I think it's an opinion-based thing. I'm of the opinion that there are plenty of stellar narrators who simply don't have the facility to do spot-on, perfect, incredible uh, accents and dialects. They can hint at it in the book. They can hint at it when they're doing their, uh, their narration and then there are people who are really good at it and make the mistake of calling attention to it. Mm. It's like here in Los Angeles, when uh, a Hispanic reporter oh. uh, over enunciates their name to the point where people are like, okay, I got it. It's Luis, you know, <laughs> I got it. Um, you know, you can take people out of the story if you make the mistake of calling attention to how good your accents are. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, right? I'm right across the, the lake from you. Oh. And I, uh, I have a North Coast accent that I can pull out of my pocket every so often, but I don't pull it out and make it so loud and so obvious and so overt that people are like, why does he sound like that? The character needs to sound perfectly in situ in the story. And the accent that you use can just nudge you towards that as opposed to overpowering you. And so for people that are worried about having to have, you know, a huge, uh, you know, catalog of accents and dialects, not necessary. Some of the best narrators in the world, yeah, you know, they're okay. Some of them are excellent. Mm -hmm. Some of them are amazing. But a lot of them aren't. And nobody is sitting there going, you know, it would be really great if he had a better Eastern Mongolian accent. <laughs> And the, the one misconception that people have or they don't think about it, is you don't have to speak the language. You don't have all of what you do is hint. If, if you meet somebody at a party and they're speaking English, but you hear a sound, you know, whenever they say the word about, but instead they pronounce it a boat, a boot. like some countries do, um, you know, in, in the States, when we hear watching TV, somebody says, oh, it's about three, all oh, Canadian. And just a few. So you, have, if you could have a sentence or more than a sentence. And if you just have the key, the key giveaway words, the hint that allows the listener to realize, oh, that's that's the Canadian person. Yeah, I got it. It's not. OK, let me see. Is that did they, did they really nail the East Toronto versus West Toronto sound? As a script supervisor, I'm forever being told to go fix their sorry, go fix that. And I'm like, oh, oh I sorry. didn't 
<laughs> you know, David, I don't, I don't know if you've experienced this. Um, I, I know some Canadians, and I know one very well, um, cannot hear the difference between it's sorry hard. and sorry. And to I, you and I, me, I, it's pretty clear. Yeah, I agree, and I believe Daniela does as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it was the hardest thing for me to learn to pick up, but the American producers would nudge me. Go, go fix their, go fix their, sorry. Oh, I, I see that we've got questions coming. I just want to ask you one more thing because we do have a lot of union performers um, in my audience. So um, does being in a union make a difference when you're posting for work on ACX? Um, it does, but not in the way that you might think. Oh. It's not a negative. Mm -hmm. It's not like if you're union, oh my God, I can't take any work on ACX. That's all non-union stuff. That's absolutely false. And by non-union, I mean non-SAG-AFTRA. Uh, mm -hmm. ACTRA does not have an agreement. As far as I know, they don't have an agreement directly with Audible, Amazon, ACX, but Canadian performers certainly can take work on ACX. And you know, I've, I've never quite understood why ACTRA has the policy that they've come up with in the last couple of years about audiobooks, but okay. Um, uh, SAG-AFTRA, on the other hand, extraordinarily friendly uh, terms. And the good news is if you're union and you take a project that meets certain minimum requirements, you're now contributing toward your pension and health via ACX, via your own little business that you've created and you're you're out there hanging out your shield as a narrator producer and you're saying yeah i'll be happy to work for you these are my rates and when you get those rates boom you're now contributing to your retirement to your health fund uh and potentially uh, qualifying for insurance we, we we know more than one actor who does audiobooks but what they do is they, rec they record enough audiobooks to earn enough to meet the minimum for the year for, for the union. They're done with their audiobooks for now. Now they, they um, that's why they do it. They enjoy it, but that's not, they want to spend their time on the stage or in front of a TV camera or something, but they do this to lock it in for the year. And that's a, that's a little bit of a different, um, you know, answer to the question of, so what should union people be worried about? Because oh. often, Sure. No, no, that's fine. That's great. Um, uh, often union people are worried, oh, well, audiobooks are all non-union, I've heard. And there's a lot of misinformation about audiobooks. People say all the time that audiobooks are this huge slog. You know, uh, we're, we're sharing with people this week a series of three free videos. And that's what we talk about in the video that came out today. Oh, yeah, yeah. This, this misconception that a 10 hour audiobook is recorded all in one day and it's awful or in three days straight and your voice is wretched and you know you don't know you don't have any time for yourself to do anything else i i, I don't understand why that's the common wisdom because it's not wise and it's not true and i find audiobooks incredibly satisfying look at me i don't get enough exercise i'm not i'm not you know I, I just, I don't do strenuous things. I, I don't, I don't, I don't need that in my life. What I, what I have is, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes at a time of narrating and then, you know, grab a coffee, sit in the break room, watch television for a while, whatever, check my email. It doesn't matter. And then do it again and do it again. And by the end of the day, you have one or two hours of, of finished work or more that you can you know, edit and get ready and, and off to the races you go. Audiobooks are not uh, something that's done in the amount of time that it looks like. It's very similar to everything else that we produce as performers. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, and um, I did want to mention that I will post a link underneath this video right when we're off the air um, as uh, where you can see these videos because amazing. They have this incredible um, a page because they, you're, this is only available once a year and is it just this week that you're promoting and then is it um, over the office? So what we have is a series of free videos this week mm -hmm. and then we'll open up registration next week once people know about the course and what it's all about and about audiobooks and ACX as well. Because one of the things that we're kind of dispelling are these myths and rumors and, and oh, I've heard that, you know, and you can't make any money. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's not 
you know, that's not a universal truth. You know, going back to that union question, um, it the the people who say, "Oh no, I I hear you can get you know you can get in real trouble with the union uh, if you audition for those jobs." That applies to a lot of sites. I I, I won't name them, but in the business, they're known as pay to play sites. Mm -hmm. So you join, you put up your your demo, whatever, and it's it's whoever will do it the cheapest basically mm. gets the job and those almost never are union approved so we're not saying wherever you can get somebody to uh, hire you to do an audiobook don't worry automatically it's uh sag after safe it, it's not necessarily certainly like five you know there are, believe it or not there are people who advertise audiobooks on fiverr i guarantee that's not something SAG after is going to sign off on. There's something really good about the Toronto boys community is they've learned to stand up for themselves. We have some oh, yeah. really great advocates here who are like, this is, you know, don't settle. One of them is my good friend, Marilla Wex. So she, she's really good at saying, Hey, ask for what you're worth. Her, she's way above. So <laughs> awesome. Um, okay. We've got a lot of people tuned in. They didn't write where they were from. Some of them I know, some of them I don't. Um, let's see what the, what, hi, Liz, Liz McEachern, uh, Jason DeLine, who's a huge voice actor and voice coach. Hi, guys. Is a USB microphone okay for directed sessions where they're recording you on their end? Just wonder about quality and latency when they're recording in their studio. So certain USB mics like that one, like the one I use, the AT2020 USB Plus, yes. Almost everyone else, no. <laughs> and, and if... If somebody decides, hey, you know, I got, I'm gonna go get that microphone. Uh, everything David just said, every syllable is important. Uh, it's uh, I'm blanking out. Uh, Audio Technica, AT AT 2020 USB Plus. All of those have to be in it. If it's not the plus, if it's not the USB, you know, because they have various different models that look pretty much the same. And we're not saying pick up any one of them. Yeah. We're saying this one. Yeah. And what he's talking about is something using like Source Connect or Clean Feed or any number of competitors to that. Uh, Source Connect uh, managed to capture the imagination of the agent communi community. And now they're demanding that you have a paid version of Source Connect when the free version, Source Connect Now, is just fine. Um, you can, uh, you, you can certainly set up a directed session very easily that way. Um, and I say very easily because, uh, any level of, if you're, if you're using source connect, you're always going to need somebody to help you either at source connect or some, somebody like uh, a George Widom, who is, uh, known for helping people set up their source connect. If you use clean feed, man, it's like you go to their website and you're done. It's awesome. And it sounds great. I did a, a whole project um, of audio description for a film. Oh, cool. Over clean feed. And they're like, wow, this is great. We don't wait. You, we don't need source connect anymore. Wait, what? And clean feed is cheap. It's like five bucks a month. It's what? awesome. So, you know, there's, there's, there's an, an awful lot of things. The, the actual mic itself um, matters in terms of quality, but not usually in terms of how it gets integrated into the other requirements that you'd have as a voice talent. Okay, so it's more important that that feed mechanism is intact for that latency thing he was asking about, right? Yeah, the latency thing is usually when you have your headphones plugged into your computer rather than that microphone actually has headphone jack on it and you oh. get your sound directly as you're speaking. So there's no latency whatsoever. The signal is also sent uh, down the line, and that's where you get latency when you monitor later in the process. So if you have your earbud, earbuds or headphones plugged into your computer, then you're hearing your voice after it's been encoded. And so that's ah. where you're getting some of that latency. But with that microphone in particular, it's got a headphone jack on it, which is awesome. Very cool. Oh, my God. Yeah, so there's no latency at all. And that's one of the reasons we get so specific make sure you know get all those syllables right in the name of the mic because not all certainly not all mics have a headphone jack and the ability to hear it in real time is is really valuable yeah um 
Jason said, Audio Technica AT 2020 plus. Cool. Thank you. I use an XLR USB, USB plus. USB plus. Oh, so AT 2020 USB plus. plus. Okay. There you go. Great. He says, cool, thank you. I use XLR mics and an interface and wondered if I could recommend this to my students who want an affordable, simple setup. And yes, I always advocate for the free Source Connect. It works just fine. Yeah, I have I have a Neumann TLM 103. I have a Neumann U87. I have a Sennheiser MKH 416. I'm looking at them. They're all on the shelf in their <laughs> little boxes. I sold my Sennheiser. <laughs> yeah, it's like I had them and it was great and i have a studio bricks in my house it's you know it's a fairly expensive option in terms of a quiet space and i only bought it because in the building next door they're now renovating for the next two years and i needed oh. that additional but before they started i was fine i was fine um i the the notion of of uh having a more expensive mic as you get further into your career is an interesting one, but it's not necessarily uh, a sure thing. Uh, there's one lesson that we teach in the course where side by side on the screen, I go to, a, uh, to Audible and I play the sample that you talked about for two of my books. One of those books, I don't say which one is which, one of those books was recorded in a professional studio at the uh, producer's location with a Neumann U87 and a rack of gear that goes on for miles. And the other was recorded in my space with my AT2020 USB plus. And I asked people to tell me which one is which. <laughs> and people usually get it right because they go, well, this one sounds like what David usually sounds like when he's talking, when he's doing the lessons. So that makes me think that's, you know, and they're absolutely right. But then they talk about the quality of that versus the one that is really heavily processed on a $4,000 microphone in a $60,000 studio. And you're like, huh, wow. So and that the heavily processed uh, is another thing to think to think about when you're done if you produce the, your audiobook and you voiced it and you're you're done that's not how it's going to sound on the consumer end uh audible is going to do things to it that a lot of sound and en sound engineers would rather not hear, you know, it's kind of like nails on a blackboard too. And I'm, and I'm on their side, actually. I mean, if I were in the, in the studio, but audible is going to compress it to the point where all, all, almost all of the really subtle things that those super expensive mics are going to pick up, they get washed out. Very cool. So Cambria has uh, like a like a market question. Um, Cambria Square. Cambria Raven Hill. Oh, okay, Cambria Raven Hill. <laughs> yeah. I have a I have a student whose name is Cambria as well, and I'm like, oh. there can't be more than two Cambrias in the entire world. It's such a great name. I know. Isn't it? I, yes. Um, she asks, is there a good market for nonfiction narration? Oh, I'm sure. Oh my that. gosh. That's all I buy is nonfiction. Yes. You know, the funny thing is people kind of differentiate between fiction and nonfiction as if they're two very different animals. And if you, for example, were to listen to the audiobook for uh, Ron Chernow's Hamilton, which is what Lin-Manuel Miranda based the Hamilton mixtapes on and then the Broadway Hamilton the musical. If you were to listen to that, you would have just as many dramatic turns and moments and scenes, conversations, plot lines. I mean, it, it was turned into a musical for God's sakes, you know? So nonfiction, fiction, you know, is, is a retelling of something that is supposed to be believable to the listener. Nonfiction is no different. Now, if you're doing a mathematics textbook, okay, you got me on that one, <laughs> right? But then look at this, you don't need any, you don't need any uh, uh, accents or dialects. You don't, there's a lot of things you don't need, right? But the, the question was, is there a huge market for it? 
the they they constantly try and and see if one is the demanded one over the other and just because there are so many other categories in the subcategories in the world of fiction yeah there are more books but the most popular talked about books other than the best sellers are these self-help books and productivity books and books on how to change your life and become a great entrepreneur and books by celebrities that are autobiography. I mean, nonfiction is a huge marketplace. And he, even, even a how-to book, um, yeah. you know, the, as uh, most of the folks watching this know, and I know, as you know, Daniela, for, for any good story, it's a journey. It starts here. And it ends over there and something has changed probably almost always for the protagonist but something has changed by the time you get to the end of the journey same thing with an on you know if, if i get a book on how to i don't know how to how to get free wi how to make my own free wi-fi station well it starts with me wanting a free Wi-Fi station, and they walk me through, tell the story. Oh, this happened has has to happen, and then this has to happen, and then if the, all those things, I end up here. Almost anything is a story, and I, I hope that doesn't sound too simplistic or idealistic. But you know the the yeah. the the book on how to fix a carburetor. That's the story of someone who needs to fix his his or her carburetor and how do you do it you know that's I, listen so i have about a hundred audiobooks and i think a hundred percent of them a hundred percent of them are nonfiction. and for if, you know for people who write fiction all day long it, it's it's just the way we relax right sure. <laughs> i think <laughs> jason has another question uh wondering how aggressive you believe we need to be as far as editing and breaths i use audacity mm. And I like the idea of doing a page per track, keeps me organized. I also like to edit as I go, read a page, edit a page, but taking out breaths automatically has mixed results. And I don't want to take the time to edit out each breath thoughts. Yeah. You've stepped into a, a landmine field here with me. Um, <laughs> first of all, I think you're doing yourself a disservice by editing a page at a time. If you're talking about an audiobook, uh, I would suggest that you edit a chapter at a time. And mm -hmm. the reason for that is the end result that you get is the file that you need to upload to ACX. If you're not talking about that, do whatever you want. I don't care. But um, the notion of debreathing, uh, I would rather have you put sharp sticks in your eyes than <laughs> debreath your work because is it, isn't that dangerous? It is, mm -hmm. and it's and it's less likely to be satisfactory. Mm -hmm. um, breaths are such an important part of storytelling there's such an important part of narration and this notion of having to de-breath your work unless you're suffering from some sort of pulmonary infection and you're really heavily breathing and and you're hacking and wheezing you shouldn't be narrating at that point anyway right. but here i'd like you to do a, a just just you know, humor me. Scott Brick is one of the most famous, well-regarded, awesome narrators in the world. Go to Audible, pick a random Scott Brick book, and listen to his retail sample. Listen to the sample of the book. And listen not for the story or for how he narrates. You can do that if you want to. That's on your own. Listen for his breathing you will find that there are tons of breaths and they're taken at the same points that anybody else would take a breath. <laughs> you know, it's not this, this it, it became kind of a, um, a, a, a false rumor that you have to get rid of all your breaths. First of all, if you do that, and because we produce things that don't, 99.9% .9 of the time have anything else playing but our voice. Mm -hmm. If you're not breathing normally, if you're not, if, if you're the listener isn't hearing you acquire air so that you can speak, it actually makes them really nervous. 
It makes them breathe for you. It takes them out of the story. And if you're doing, as an example, a list, I went to the store, I, I went to the, 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 the gas station, I come home and the dog has torn up everything. It, you know, and you're taking these breaths because the story calls for it. If you were like, yeah, I can leave my, my dog at home. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't, it, it, I mean, okay, it, occasionally, but you hear those breaths no matter what yeah. and taking them out is not necessary. And it actually degrades the artistic quality of what you're coming out with. Huh? Oh my God. You just enlightened me on something, but first, Dan, you wanted to say something. Um, well, just agreeing with David, um, I have seen w at least a couple of people, both not audiobook narrators, just people, uh, I come out of the radio industry. Uh, so, you know, radio or, or voiceover people, at least a couple say bragging that they can remove all their breaths from the project. Well, yeah, that's actually one of the, it, that's not hard to remove your breaths. Why are you bragging? It's, but until really, until we had digital, it wasn't that easy to remove breaths or to uh, shrink them or anything to, to alter them. And now, or when digital came along, wow, look, we, we can do this. Well, yeah, you, you, you can also, it's much easier to play uh, dialogue backwards to hear dirty words, but that doesn't mean it's appropriate. And the other thing also with this is that there's a whole industry around plugins that do deep breathing. Mm -hmm. And so that gives it some sort of imprimatur, some sort of, you know, uh, veracity that this is a thing that we not only should do, but should do with this really cool plugin that deep breaths everything. And it's given it a false, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a false satisfaction to people to do this. And so I'm on a personal mission to just like be yourself. And it, 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 I know firsthand how seductive it can be, how tempting it can be either to get rid of those breaths or to greatly cut them down because I, I record a lot of stuff and I'm not a professional voice actor uh by by any means but like the the video that you referenced before um when i started doing those videos years ago i hear myself breathing and on, on the playback and i think well gosh all these industry people they're gonna think that i don't know how to how to use a microphone and i kind of worry. I, I didn't worry about it. I just spent extra time. Well, oh, let's drop this one a little. Okay, let's get rid of this one. And now, unless it's egregious, you know, if, <gasps> you know, well, okay, let's, let's do something about that. Unless it's egregious, I, I let it sit there. But I've been in the business, so to speak, you know, radio and all things like that, my whole life. And I never thought about my breath you know on the air david when you were a, a you know a, a radio personality did you ever think you might have thought about no. your voice but not not yeah. your breathing yeah no i was much i was much more concerned about uh hitting the top of the hour news right on the button and you know talking over the intro of a song and stopping right before the singers start you know talking tight to the vocals i had all kinds of other uh <laughs> metrics for success yeah. that had nothing to do with breathing and to be fair, radio engineers put gates in place. They put expansion gates in place that that lessen the the heavy breathing that some some uh, DJs and talk show hosts have. But it's just not a thing to worry about. I want to give. Is it Jason that you said? Yeah, Jason Deline. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want to give him a. Uh, I want to give you Jason a, uh, a a permission slip, a hall pass. You don't have to worry about this anymore. You know, if you're going to worry about anything, worry about being the best you you can be. And you do that already. So you don't have much. He's a great artist. Yeah. 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 Um, do you guys, I know we went overtime. Do you have five more minutes? Because there's a couple we don't, more. We don't have an overtime. I thought we were going to go for at least four <laughs> hours. <laughs> we, neither of us has anything going on in our lives. So yeah, yeah. not that we're launching this course or anything. No. Yeah, I know. I'm like, no, you know, it's fine. Of course. Um, my my next thing is a couple of hours from now. 
Okay, literally five more minutes because I see a few more questions, but I do want to tell you and Jason a quick story because you just blew me away with that last uh, bit of advice. And that's because I recently, Jason is one of my entrepreneurial uh, students in Coffee Break MBA. And Jason, I had to record a VSL for the very first time, a video sales letter, and I made the critical mistake of cutting out all my breaths. Everyone said, Daniela, we usually connect with your videos. What is wrong with this video? Uh, no one can connect with you and you seem really nervous. And I wasn't nervous. So I had They were to... nervous. <laughs> they were nervous. I'm, for kidding. I'm not kidding yeah. you. They were breathing for you. They were concerned. <laughs> I, re I had to reshoot. I had to go back, book studio time, reshoot. And so that was a huge lesson. I'm never cutting out my breaths again, at least for, for sales or anything where I have to sell a story or anything, right? Yeah. Um, Daniela, am I, am I correct in understanding that they didn't know what the problem was? They didn't say- No, they had no idea. Hear the breath. They I knew what I did. Wrong. I knew what I did differently in that video because yeah. I was like, okay, now this is going into the market. It's got to be professional. Da, 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 da. It's not like my YouTube videos where I can ramble. And <laughs> no, um, Jason, if you ever do a VSL, don't, don't, don't deep breath it. It was a, it was an expensive lesson for me to learn. Um, okay. And Jason says, I come from a commercials and animation and uh, background and many producers and engineers ask for no breaths but glad to hear your perspective on this for audiobooks. I totally agree. Good tip on editing chapters to thank you so much. Legit legitimacy, he said. I don't know what that was in response to. Nikki in LA asks, do you cover how and when to choose different payment types? Oh, that's a good question. Also, I've heard many versions of 654 hours of work per one finished hour. Is there a good average work hmm. to finished ratio? Yeah. So first of all, the project is set up by the rights holder in whatever payment structure they choose. Okay. And you can then negotiate with them if you want to, but usually when they put it up, they're pretty much finished with that process. We do talk about moving a rights holder from royalty share only to royalty share plus. And I'm kind of proud of this because royalty share plus just came into play uh, in the last few years. We'd been teaching it under a different name called uh uh you know st what, what was that uh, something stipend what, what did i call it i forget uh, what i call hy it uh, uh, hybrid stipend. stipend yeah so where it's an additional payment for the production plus the royalty share so yes you have different ways of being paid but usually you're being offered one of those three ways by the rights holder and you really need to you know, let people know what you're willing to do before you are booked on the job. So yes, we teach that very carefully. We talk about the pros and cons of each one of those and how to move rights holders on the needle when it comes to them wanting you as the narrator. There was something else that you'd asked about. What was the rest of your question? Oh, the ratio of work to finish. You know, ah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so remember when I was talking about the stair step method? That's exactly why the stair step method is awesome because we can effectively cut down. And what you're talking about is, is every so often ACX and Audible will have a survey where they ask all the narrators that respond to the survey, how many work hours does it take for you to have a finished hour of work? And it's, and it's almost always between six and 10 hours to do one finished hour of work. And that's because with punch and roll, you have to go back and listen all the way through to make sure that each one of your little punch and rolls is smooth and you didn't clip the words and you didn't leave in two breaths and you didn't jump in late or jump in early. Whereas with the stair step method, everything is perfectly clean and you really can't miss an edit. It's impossible to do so. And for those of you that use a clicker or yell pick up, so that you can see the little, you know, yeah. over oversized uh, waveform, you can miss things there as well. So what we found, and certainly in my case, my ratio is a little over two and a half hours to one. Yeah. And the, the average that our students report is between two and a half and three. Wow. Um, now, now, having said that, undoubtedly, there's some that it's four yes. hours, it's five hours, but that right around three hours is the most common that I hear. And we have that one person who uh, he did one session where he said it was one and a quarter hours per finished hour, which 
is really that's, insane. And, and that's likely because he didn't have very many edits to make. That that's um, probably it too. I will say, if you're going to get into this, try to avoid the little games that we play in our heads. Like, oh, I got through that whole chapter without one single error. Yes, I did. Because by the time you're three quarters of the way through that, you realize that that's what's happening. <laughs> and now you're nervous. Now you're telling the story a different way because your metric is, I don't need to make a mistake. I want that, that medal that I can wear. <laughs> Worry always about the story. Right. Pay attention to the story. How many times, Daniela, have you been a script supervisor or a writer on set and watched five, 10 takes of something. Oh God, every time. Ups, yeah, or pickups on something. Yeah. You know, it's what ends up being seen by the viewer or heard by the listener that matters. Not your ability to get through a whole book and only have five pickups to do. That's, it's, it's not a thing. Right. Oh, and David mentioned something earlier that if we can go back to for, for a second, that the rights holder determines how the, the, you'll get paid. Well, the rights holder determines how they want to do it. That doesn't mean you have to do it. it. Doesn't mean you have to do the title. Doesn't mean you have to do the terms necessarily. Uh, if they come, for example, if they come to you, which does happen if you're mm -hmm. doing your job right, they contact you and they say, yeah, it's a royalty share only. For those of you who don't know, royalty share, you get nothing up front. You get a percentage. You get 20% of the sale price of every title. And um, if they come to you and they say, yeah, I only do royalty share, but I really like you. We've, we've got a template. We've got an email template for explaining, hey, it's great. You know, I, I, I listened. I, I read the material. It looks good. Now, uh, while I can't do strictly royalty share, what, I, what we could do is this. And then you lay it out for them. So, and I, I'm saying all of this just because um, I, I don't want people to think that the rights holder gets to determine how you get paid. They only determine how they want to pay. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. I yep. hope that helps, Nikki. She didn't respond. Um, she hasn't heard it yet. Oh, that's true. There's a 20 second delay between 20 Zoom. or 30, depending upon. You know. <laughs> oh, is that is that in case we say dirty words, bad words like I don't know. There's or, I always say dirty words on my channel. Don't worry. David, <laughs> and I mean it. And I that was the yeah, she says, yep, yep, she heard it. Thank you. That was helpful. Um I, I want to let you go, but I do have one more question from me. It's it's a question I have about your program. Does it encompass, like, if you want it, because we have a number of people who are entrepreneurs who want to, you know, create their own nonfiction book. Does it give them all the tools, they, it, as well as tools for performers who, who just want to participate in ACX as narrators? So I think what you're asking is, do we teach people how to write books? No, no, not that part, but like okay. they, they're going to write it, but it, can they self-produce it? I guess it's oh, the sure. same skills. That's exactly, you're... that's exactly what we teach. Yeah. So <laughs> good for you, Daniela, for hitting the nail right on the head. No, the whole point of ACX is bringing what has been happening over the last couple of decades, which is working from home, a narrator not just going to a studio somewhere and sitting by themselves in a booth with no console, no software, nothing but them and a microphone and doing the voicing and having somebody else do all the production work. This course is about doing the whole enchilada mm. and being not only the narrator, but also the producer, the editor, the mastering person, and the business guidance person, the, the customer relations, the client relations person. You have to wear all those hats. And the joy for me is I love wearing all those hats. I don't look at any one of those things as being, I don't want to do that, you know? Great. You know, David, oh hearing God. you list all those things is very intimidating <laughs> um, because it, it, it can sound like each of those is discreet, you know, the producing the voicing, the editing, the, it's all, especially with David's stair-step method, it's all in one. It's, yeah. it's, it's painless. Yeah. So it's, and, don't get scared by those things that David just named. 
Yeah, we take we take very clear advantage of advances in technology that have happened over the last 20 years and in in small no small measure over the last few years we have a tool that we teach people how to use for proofing their work mm. that also cuts down on the amount of time that you spend both finding those errors and fixing those errors and it's a joy to work with and it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for artificial intelligence it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for services of software so we do all of those things and it's not intimidating at all in fact it for me anyway i don't know maybe i'm goofy it's fun i would geek out on that too oh my yeah. god this what a joy it has been to talk to you what a fantastic mm. program i'm gonna uh, post a link below uh, right after i get offline uh thank you both so much for your time you're you're both such pros and um just a joy to talk to um and good luck on the launch i'm looking forward to it <laughs> yeah well, thank you we got we got this, three videos coming out fun. this week. Danielle, it's so nice to see you again. It is so nice to see you too. <laughs> and nice to meet you, Dan. Nice to meet you too. I, I still want to know if uh, I know your Toronto girlfriend. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> you can email you me. Too, you two can connect. Because because I know everybody. That's the thing. I know everybody. <laughs> okay.